in the video asking the question, what is a spirit? I made a reference to the human body as being a vessel and I didn't provide any kind of supporting evidence for that and so uh, I wanted to talk about that a little bit here in more detail since it came up in that video. So I'm going to be reading a footnote from in the book. Uh, the book is linked to in the description as well as the original video. I'm going to be reading a footnote from 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 18. And this, I'm not going to give a page number because the pages are changing. Um, it'd probably be in the 600s or somewhere like that. But um, this is in this uh, section with inferred references to the Holy Spirit. And so it's, this, it's the chapter where all of the verses are color-coded yellow because they mention the word spirit, but they don't explicitly mention the word Holy Spirit, right? Um, and so this, um, this verse, Then the Spirit came upon Amasai, who was chief of the captains, and he said, Thine are we, David, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse, peace, peace be upon thee, and peace be upon thine helpers, for thy God helpeth thee. Then David received them and made them captains of the band. And so this, this word here, the spirit came upon, is interesting. I mean, in the English, honestly, it's pretty humdrum. But in the original Hebrew language that this uh, book was written in, the little Hebrew reads, the spirit clothed himself with Amasai. And so if you can think of Amasai as like, a, like an overcoat, just kind of sitting there, and then the spirit is like... Whoop! And then now Amasai becomes his clothing. And so, of course, the, the implication here is, is that Amasai is a container. He's a flesh bag. <laughs> He's an organic vessel that can be used by a spirit, in this case, of course, the Holy Spirit, to accomplish his purposes. Um, so then I have... Here, there is a distinct picture in the scriptures of the human body being a vessel. And then I have 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. There is a term in the Old Testament, ob translated as familiar spirit and so this is one of the instances where you would do a, an English word search for spirit and familiar spirit would come up except it's not using the word ruach it's using a different word that refers to a different thing a familiar spirit is an unclean spirit Jesus it is under the dominion of Satan and it is um, I think it's pretty similar to the spirit of divination that is talked about in Acts whenever um, Paul confronts the, the servant girl with the spirit of divination. Uh, it is a spirit that enables fortune telling and soothsaying. Basically predictions of the future. And so if you think about a spirit, um, uh, largely the spiritual realm is invisible to us, but it is not invisible to other spirits. And so those spirits see us and they take in what we're doing, but they also see what's going on around them. And based upon that vastly increased amount of information and probably superior kind of information that they have compared to us, they're able to say, oh, this thing is going to happen and that thing's going to happen. But does that mean that they're always right? No. Does that mean that they are a source that we should seek? Absolutely not. God uniformly condemns um, anything, psychics, mediums, enchanters, sorcery, witchcraft, any kind of thing that depends upon any kind of, remember I said spirits are like power and information. Anybody who's depending upon a power source or an information source that is not the Lord our God is an abomination to God and he hates it and detests it. And it's one of the reasons honestly why like the whole Harry Potter thing is so very disturbing 
because it's just like it's 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 taking a thing that God hates and God says that he's going to remove from the face of the earth and it's glorifying it and it's normalizing it and it's desensitizing it and it makes it seem like it's kind of hip and cool. Jesus, I actually talked to a, a youth minister one time and he said his, his students were actually being seduced by the thing and were actually there was increased interest in the notion of witchcraft because they portray it in a in a friendly Light, oh, I'm going to go get something to eat, and oh, i got to go get my homework done, and oh, I'm going to go cast a spell. And it's just it's almost like it's like, a, like some kind of a normal thing. Anyway, I digress. <sighs> okay, so this, um, again, talking about the term, Old Testament term, ob, tr- translated as familiar spirit, which is not the word ruach, it's a different word. Leviticus 19.31, regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God, Jesus. Here the person is defined not in terms of their name or occupation, but instead by the spirit they had. Again, the implication is that a person, a body is a vessel. This word, ob, can mean water bottle which was characterized by its hollow sound, and thus the implication is that the body is simply a vessel in which the spirit carried out its activities. Also consider Luke 11.24. The demon calls the person my house. So Luke 11, 24 through 26, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and finding none, he saith, uh, I will return unto my house from whence I came. The house is the man. <laughs> Uh, and when he cometh and he findeth it swept and garnished, then goeth he and taketh him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. And we can also see several times when the Spirit of the Lord is said to come upon someone, the, the literal Hebrew text. The Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with, and so Judges 6.34, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. So in other words, the Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with Gideon. Second Chronicles twenty four twenty, and the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest. The Spirit of God clothed himself with Zechariah is the literal Hebrew again. Um, believers have a similar implication as we are called the temple of God, where the Holy Spirit dwells. And so if we consider if we consider the Remember what, remember what Jesus said in John chapter 4. Now the Jews worship in Jerusalem and the Samaritans worship in Samaria, right? On their mountain. But there's coming a time, and that time is now, that Jesus was ushering in the new covenant. Whenever it won't matter where you worship. In other words, God is removing the geopolitical constraint, which started with the tent, the tabernacle, Eventually, Solomon built the first temple. It was a geopolitical location, and their religion in Israel demanded that they go to a physical place. Imagine the hardship of having to go to a physical place. Um, when If there's a famine, if there's a war, if you don't have enough money to go um, and bring sacrifices, it's, it's, it's a, I'm sure it would be a wonderful trip. But it would be a hardship and a difficulty. And so now, part of the glory of the new covenant is that God has not constrained us to go to Israel. Can you imagine if all Christians everywhere, you know, supposedly billions of people, probably more like millions of people who are actually sealed by the Holy Spirit. But um, can you imagine that, that billions of people all have to go to Jerusalem? you know, a hotbed of, of unrest and uh, political intrigue and jealousy and ambition and all this kind of stuff. It's like, can you imagine that? I mean, it'd be <laughs> it's kind of pretty scary, pretty scary. Okay, so now I'm making a reference to, uh, again, not going to give an exact page, but in the th- just after page 1000 somewhere, and so this is in the um, special topics section, the last chapter, Um, Man's body is the new temple. And uh, I have several scriptures here, but um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, 
which ye have of God, and you are not your own. You are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay? And so, Jesus so cleansed our heart and our insides that he actually allowed the Holy of Holies to come inside of us, right? And so remember the, the temple, the Holy of Holies. So there's the, the courtyard, there's the inner sanctum, and there's the Holy of Holies. And so this, this also follows the pattern of um, the, the, the triune man. The outside, the courtyard is the body. The inside, inner room is the soul. It's called a tri tripartite temple, which was common in the East during this time. And then the Holy of Holies is the place where the Ark of the Covenant, which is representative of the Spirit in the very presence of the living God, is in that place. Okay. Um, a priest could only go, he went in the whole, it's called, so the holy place and then the most holy place is the Holy of Holies. He went in, a priest went in the holy place all the time to replace the, the bread of the presence and so on. And burn incense. But the the Holy of Holies, we're the Ark of the Covenant. And there's this big old thick curtain. Remember the curtain was rent from top to bottom. The priest only went in there once a year. Okay. And he had to go through all these ceremonies of cleansing. And if he did anything wrong, if he made one mistake, because God is holy and he is worthy of perfection. And perfection minus one is not good enough. If you drop a pencil on the ground... You die. And we think of that as, but God is holy. And we don't, we don't understand that he's perfect. All he's known from eternity to eternity is perfection. And then we, the, the creatures that rebel against God are humans and demons. Okay. The we brash little upstarts come on the scene and we say, I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do, even though you're infinite, eternal God and I'm a little empty, little nothing. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do my name, my name, my glory for me. And so you think that you take that kind of an attitude and you go into the holy of holies, the very symbol of the presence of the living God. Um, I heard one person say one time, it's the Ark of the Covenant is the safest place on earth because anybody who touches it that's not in God's will, they just drop dead. They just, whoop. Even, even whenever David was moving the Ark um, to the, the tabernacle in the city of David, and uh, Uzzah just reached over to stabilize it because he thought the, the oxen were stumbling, he dropped dead. I mean, it, seem, it seems like it's an innocent thing, but God is holy and he demands perfection. And if you make one error, if you make one error, you're guilty forever and there's nothing you can do about it. You see what I'm saying? It's like th this standard of holiness, the priest could only go in the Holy of Holies once a year. And if he made a mistake, he dropped dead. And so I don't know this. It doesn't say it in the Bible, but they probably tied a rope around his ankle so that if he did drop dead, which was a real possibility, then they could drag him out because crap, if he di died and then you're going in there to touch a, touch a carcass, which made you unclean, you would drop dead too. And so can you imagine like the bodies piling up, right? And so they, they probably tied a, a rope around his, his foot so that they could pull him out if he died. But then again, you know, that it's a God didn't tell them to do that. And so that's an interesting question. You know, does that violate God's law? And so would that cause them to die? I don't know. It's speculation. It's complete speculation. It's not in the Bible. Um, my point is this. The blood of Jesus and Christ on the cross so took our sins and so washed us and cleansed us on our insides that our insides are that holy of holies that's not in some geopolitical location anymore in a geographical location, in a building. Our body is, we are the building of God. We are the temple of God. Let's read another verse. There, I mean, there's, so, there's many verses here. Um, 
Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. 1 Peter 2, 5. Ye... Also, as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And so, all of this to say, the body is a vessel. The body is supposed to be a temple. The body is a, is a place where spirits dwell. Obviously, the most common spirit that dwells in any person's body is their own spirit, Right? But, as we see throughout Scripture, demons take a hold of bodies whenever they're able to do it. Um, the Holy Spirit is jealous for us, as James says, and desires and yearns for us and desires to, to indwell our body. Of course, he's sovereign, right? And so he, he decides who he indwells and who he doesn't indwell um, because he's God. Right, and so he can do what he wants to. Uh, there's nothing that any human's going to do, and no mere decision that a human's going to make that's going to stop him from hit, accomplishing his purpose. Um, but the human, the human body is a a vessel, and so if you th- if you think about the body in that way, a vessel a vessel can hold all kinds of things, right? I mean, obviously it has a capacity. It only has, has so much capacity, but up to the capacity, it can hold all different kinds of stuff. And so you can put very different kinds of things in a vessel, right? And again, this goes back to the reference of John chapter 1. The, the word existed before everything was created. And so the, the, vessel, the idea of a vessel and then you just putting stuff in a vessel, God created vessels to teach us a spiritual lesson. And of course, the lesson is grounded in a, in, a, in a biblical evidence, and I'm not just making it up. God created Kleenex to, and I make up something like, we're, we're coming from a biblical basis here, right? Which is why I, can, I believe that I can safely make the claim. And so we, we, we see in the property of vessels that you can put all kinds of things in a vessel, Right? Some some vessels are to honor, some vessels are to dishonor, right? And so you could put water, and then you could put so water in half of the vessel, and then the other half of the vessel, sewage. Jesus. You could put um, the human spirit. I mean, just to give a very simple example, the human spirit in one third of the vessel, the Holy Spirit in one third of the vessel, Jesus has said that he was given the Spirit without measure, right? Which implies that the Holy Spirit can be given with measure. I don't think people like that. People seem to generally like to argue, oh, if you have the Holy Spirit, then you have the Holy Spirit. It is done forever and we will never discuss it again. Well, I mean, that, that's, just you, that's just you imposing your little idea that you made up on Scripture. God can do whatever he wants. He can issue any regulation in the spiritual realm that he wants to. And so... Um, a person can can have just, a, just the lightest touch of the Holy Spirit, or a person can have the full on knock you knock you off your feet kind of thing. Like God doesn't doesn't have to do things according to the way you think that He should do them, right? And so um, Satan in the Book of Job comes into the presence of God, even though the Bible says that God cannot look on evil. And so it's just it, it's it's a very interesting thing that you'd think. It's almost like matter and antimatter, like somehow it'd blow up. Now, Satan is not the opposite of God. That's a bad example because antimatter is the opposite of matter. But the devil is not the opposite of God because God's infinite and eternal and the devil's an ant. He's a handmaiden. He's a little, he's a little, like he's a little nothing. And so that was a bad example. The, the point is, is that, that the devil can be in God's presence and it it is the world doesn't implode or something like it ha- it's happened okay and so we d- we don't like these the kind of way of thinking but so you can be in a vessel one third human spirit one third holy spirit again i'm making up proportions just for a simple example one third 
demons. Right? Oh, people don't want to hear that because oh, I don't want to have demons because it doesn't make me feel good about myself. Right? That's another video. That's another video. Um, the point is, is that a vessel can be filled with all different kinds of things. You could put some sand, you could put some marbles, you could put some grain, you can put some Kleenex, you can put some dirt, you can put light bulbs, you could put a piece of carpet, just on and on and on, up until the capacity of the vessel. You can put all kinds of things, uh, all kinds of things in a vessel. The idea that you can only put one thing in a vessel and nothing else can be in that vessel, it's, not, it's, not, it's just not, I mean, if, if, if you have a vessel where only one thing fits in it, then... That's not a normal vessel, right? So, the point is uh, that I made a reference to the human body being a vessel in this video, what is a spirit? And so here we talked about um, what the Bible has to say about the human body being a vessel.